But this week, I, I want to finish Mission Matters, and, and what we're doing, we have a little less to cover this week than what we've covered in some of the other weeks. And in many ways, trying to take all the threads that we've had through the last five weeks, both with local missions and international missions, and uh, thinking through the theological aspects of what it means to make disciples. And I want to sort of bring all those threads together, sort of try to tie them up some as we, we bring this to a close. And then at the end, I want us to spend some time actually thinking through and praying for um, several things, praying for our ones. Uh, praying for uh, some Buckron uh, missions partners, and then praying for our church, praying for the Lord to do a work here. Uh, if there's ever a spot to take some class time to actually pray, um, the Lord would save people, I would think it's the class on missions. And so uh, I don't want to neglect that in this class to just talk about missions or talk about our partners or talk about what we should do, but we want to pray. We want to ask the Lord for help, ask the Lord for wisdom, uh, and ask the Lord to, to work through us as we share the gospel with people. Uh, so this week we're going to talk about Persuasion. The disciples persuade on the mission. So if you've got your booklet, this is the last week in there. Uh, talk about what, what does it mean, some overall characteristics of ones who, who share the gospel. Um, that, that we are to, to be essentially winsome. We're to be selfless when we share the gospel. That the, the gospel confidence drives evangelism. Right? That we share the gospel not because we're wise, not because we're more spiritual than other people, or not because we're better than people. But we share the gospel because we know God. God has saved us, and we want other people to know Christ. And we have confidence that God is still saving sinners, and that uh, if still people will repent and turn to Christ, that they'll be saved. And so we, we share the gospel with confidence, and it ought to drive how we are. And so much of what we're going to look at today is what does it look like for us to share the gospel? What, what sort of characteristics should we have in all of our conversations, whether that's using the three circles, whether that's sharing the gospel with your kids or your coworker or your neighbor or somebody else in your family? What does it look like? Uh, a couple of overarching things that we would at least say at the beginning, is that selfishness smothers evangelism. That if we're selfish, if we think only of ourself, not only will you not share the gospel well, most of the time, if you're selfish, you won't share the gospel at all. Right? That selfishness causes us to think about ourselves. If you are only concerned with yourself, you will find that you are very, uh, very often not burdened at all about the eternity of other people. How often, let's just be honest, how often do you go through your day and you realize that everything you thought about, everything you worried about, everything that you really did for that day was about you. It's about your schedule, about the things on your list you had to get done, about the, the things that made your life hard, the things that make your life easier, that most of our day, if we're just honest, is designed around what makes our life easier, what helps us to feel better, to have enjoyment, or that our, our work, or the things we stress about often have to do with us. When's the last time that you got home from work and were wore out because you were burdened over the lostness of the people that you work with. That, that you work with people who don't know Jesus and would die and go to a crisis eternity. And yet you're wore out because you, you're burdened and you didn't get an opportunity to share with them. And you don't know if you're gonna go, going to. It's not true for most of us, right? Most of us are relatively selfish people. We think about ourselves. Selfishness smothers evangelism. It'll keep us from sharing the gospel because it distracts us. It keeps us focused on ourselves. And evangelism is others focused. We share so that they might know. It's not enough to say, well, I'm saved, so who cares what happens to other people? You know, the gospel drives us to care about other people. The gospel drives us to, to see them as more important than ourselves, that we, we want them to know the gospel. So uh, we talk about the evangelistic snob. Um, this is, he's a cousin to the, uh, uh, what was it, the righteous jerk, the self-righteous jerk that Dr. York talked about in, in Luke. Uh, the evangelistic snob is his cousin. Uh, this is the person who essentially says, uh, shares the gospel and says, you can, you can believe the gospel, you can come to this church, you can be a member here, you can sort of join our community, if you will, uh, slob, so they're not snob, if, if you will uh, just believe these things or just say these things, but you don't have to change your life at all. Or you just come put, your li you come put your name on the roll, right? You don't have to worry about your life. You know, Jesus doesn't care about what your life looks like. Is that the gospel? Are we saved by what we do? No, we're not saved by what we do. But when we come to faith in, in Christ, when we really and truly, genuinely repent of our sins and put our faith truly in Jesus, does it change us? Yeah. That, that coming to Christ is not simply getting your name on a roll. It's pretty easy to get your name on a church roll these days, right? It's, it's really not that hard. That's not what it means to come to Jesus, right? Take this as a, from a guy who is really helped by church rolls. It's 
Good to have a church role, to know who's a member and who are we responsible for, who are we caring for. But having your name on a church role doesn't mean that you're a believer, that that we don't want to be slobs, that we want to not just call other people to holiness through Christ, but we want to also care about what our own life looks like, right? That we're going to be changed by the Holy Spirit, that we're going to seek to live out uh, the, the gospel through our lives so that those coworkers or those neighbors or those family members don't just hear you talk about the gospel, but they see that modeled in your life. We all probably know people who say one thing and do another. If they see you live a life that does not line up with the gospel, it will not matter what you say. Right? You either will not get hearings at all, right? they won't, you won't have opportunities to share the gospel, or they will tune you out when you share it because they'll say, I know what your life looks like. If that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to be a Christian. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody and they told you they didn't want to trust Jesus because of the way Christians act? I hear that a lot. All the church is just a bunch of hypocrites. I know what these Christians do. We don't want to add to that. We don't want to be the the evangelistic slob saying, I'm not going to change. I'm just going to say these things. We we also don't want to say that you must adjust to me. So that sharing the gospel is meaning we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, what he has done for sinners, and calling on people to repent and believe. We're trying to live out the gospel in our life. I'm calling people to be conformed to Jesus, not conformed to me. Does that make sense? I'm not asking them to be a little Chris. I'm not asking them to be me. I'm asking them to be conformed by the Holy Spirit, that they may look more like Jesus. This is what Paul says. He doesn't say, follow me. What does Paul say? Follow me as I what? Follow Christ, right? Paul's saying, the only reason you would follow me is because I'm trying to be conformed into the image of Jesus, that you too might be conformed into the image of Christ. So what we're saying to people is not, you must adjust to me, you must be like me, you must look like me, think like me, dress like me, you must do everything, like the same songs that I like, you don't have to be like me. I'm not calling you to be a disciple of me, I'm calling you to be a disciple of Christ, right? that we're, we're pushing people to, to trust Christ. Uh, the evangelistic slob, his brother is the snob. This is the person who essentially says, I'm better than you. I'm sharing the gospel with you as a kindness to you because I'm so above your station, you should recognize the mercy and the grace that I'm showing to you to steep down to your level to share the gospel with you. If you were just as good as me, if your life was as put together as mine, if you did all the good things that I did, if you knew all the good things that I did, most of the time the evangelistic snob will be happy to tell you all the good things that he's done. Right, if your life was just as good as mine, right, Jesus would love you too. That is, it is thinking that somehow because we're believers, we're better than other people. Right? We're not better than other people. Right? As believers, we should know more than anybody else what we actually deserve. We're aware of our sin more than anybody else. We know that we're broken. We know that we're sinners. We know that we need the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus. And the only reason we're saved is because of the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus. Not because we're better than anybody. So we don't want to go to people and say, I, I'm, and come with this, this air of superiority. I'm smarter. I'm more spiritual. I'm, I'm better than you. Let me reach down and try to help you up. Like, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is one sinner who's saved by grace, sharing with another sinner how he might be saved by grace, right? We're not better than anybody, but we don't want to uh, act like we're better than him, and we don't want to say, you'll never live up to me. Right? Jesus will save you, and sometimes the implication is, he didn't have to stoop that low to save me. He's going to have to come awfully low to save you, right? He's going to have to humble himself an awful lot to save you, and at least you'll be saved. You'll never be like I am, right? You'll never live up to me, but you might be saved. Both of these things flow out of selfishness, a high view of self, right? a lack of humility, thinking more of yourself than, than you ought to. The opposite of selfishness, I would argue, is not just selflessness, but it's winsomeness, right? It is this selflessness, uh, you, I, heard, I don't remember who it was, somebody uh, defined winsomeness as selflessness with some kindness mixed in, right? That it is, it is a winsomeness, it, it wins people over. That winsomeness, on the opposite side, waters evangelism, it helps it to grow, uh, so let's, we're going to talk about several characteristics of, of winsome evangelism, evangelism that seeks to win people over, that seeks to, to show them the gospel. First, the head of the evangelist is knowledge. Colossians 1, 9 through 10 says, and, and so since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. He says, I'm praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Right? We, we talked about at the very beginning of this class that you can't share the gospel unless you know the gospel. 
You can't share what you don't know. The, the part of what it means to share the gospel means that we, we want to have the head of an evangelist. We want to know the Bible. If you're afraid of sharing the gospel, if you're afraid that you won't know what to say, or you don't know the answers to questions, remember what we say you could do? You can study. right? You can read the Bible. You, you can ask the Lord for help. If you're afraid that you don't know the Bible well enough, Right? One, you can pray and ask the Lord for help in the moment and trust that the God, God uses you even if you have little knowledge, but you can grow in your knowledge. That's what we do as believers. We, we seek knowledge. We're not mystics uh, thinking that knowledge will drop into our head. No, God has given us his word that we may be committed to it, that we may learn and grow through it, that we would, we would seek knowledge, that we wouldn't, would have a full knowledge of the will of God, and that we might impart knowledge to other people. They can't trust Jesus if they've never heard of him. We've got to tell them about Christ. We've got to tell them about what Jesus has, has done, uh, that they may hear it and repent and believe. The heart of, of an evangelist is love. John says, by, all, by this all people, well, Jesus says this in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. M- much of what we see now classified as evangelism I would argue, is loveless. That it, it holds out the gospel, but it does so in a demanding way, in a way that is lacking in love. Right? Love greases the wheels of human relationships. That, that People will not care. This is the old saying, people don't care what you know until they know that they, they, you love them. Right? That, that these people that you want to share the gospel with, whether it's your one or it's somebody in your, you work with or somebody in your family or your, or your neighbor, they need to know that you love them. And Jesus says that they'll know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, here Jesus talks about particularly the love between believers, that we ought to love one another. Right? The way that the church loves each other as brothers and sisters in Christ is a testimony to the world that we belong to him. In, in 1 John, uh, John goes even further to talk about way that the way that this love extends to other people, that this is love, that he laid down his life for his friends, that love lays down our life for the people around us, that, that the, the heart of evangelists is one of love, not demanding, not seeking its own uh, way, but in, instead seeking to love other people, to, to draw them into Christ, that they may know the love of Jesus. We have known the love of Jesus, and it's through us that they can know the love of Christ as well, that we get to tell them about that love. You can tell, can't you, when people don't love you? You, you can tell when you're being sold to. Uh, I think I shared it in here. I, it's a pet peeve. I I'm appreciate salesmen. I think they have a really hard job. My pet peeve is I hate to be sold to. I don't like it. It's, a, it is like, it, I just, it's just not fun for me. I don't enjoy it. Uh, I understand a lot of what they're doing. Uh, and I, I, don't like, I, I think I've told the story in here. Um, when people find out I'm a pastor and they're like trying to sell to me, it's always funny um, especially if they're not a believer, they, because they, I'm a pastor, they like try to like pitch me in a certain way. Uh, when we first moved to Frankfurt, we were seeing houses and this lady asked what I, this, this lady showed us a house and, uh, she asked what I did and I told her I was a pastor. And so the rest of the time as she's showing us, I was like, this room, this is where you could meet your per- parishioners, your people, your, this is where you could do like, and she's just trying to like, the rest of the time I was like, you could, you could pray. This could be a place for you guys. So like, like just, like just tell me, just, just tell me the things about the house. Uh, we met with a guy trying to sell us, uh, this was years ago, uh, homeowners insurance or renters insurance or something and he's going through the list of what's covered and he's like you know it covers water damage and storms you know what we might term acts of god right these are <laughs> things that god I'm like i just i don't i don't I, I know that i know what they're doing they're trying to make a personal connection with me so that they can sell me something i appreciate it it's fine it's annoying to me but uh, it's not they're not doing a wrong thing they're doing their job well you know when people genuinely care about you versus when they're trying to sell you something the heart of the evangelist is not the heart of a guy just trying to sell you something, right? It should be a heart of genuine love that we actually care about people. I'm not sharing the gospel with my neighbor so I can check a box and feel good about myself that, all right, I shared the gospel with my neighbor, I've done my part, I'm moving on. No, I want to share the gospel with my neighbor because I love him and I care about his eternity and I don't want him to die and go to a crisis eternity. Like, there's a difference there that will change the way I have those conversations. The heart of an evangelist is love which then leads us to the attitude of evangelists, gentleness and respect. Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart, honor Christ the, Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in, in you. Right, I hear that text a lot. Right, I'm just making a defense. I'm ready to defend the gospel. 
Peter says, always be ready to make a defense for the hope that is in you. But does that, is that where Peter stops? He says, yet, do it with gentleness and respect. That sharing the gospel is no excuse to be a jerk. Peter says, be ready to give a defense, but do it with gentleness and respect. If anybody ought to be able to have a conversation about spiritual things with gentleness and respect, it ought to be believers. That we are not in this to fight people or to win arguments, right? This is what, this is what married life is sometimes. It's, not, it's no longer about what the fight is. It's just about winning the fight. It's not about the thing you're fighting. It's just you just want to win the fight. I, that's not me. I just hear that from other people that they do that. Uh, <laughs> It can become like that sometimes in evangelistic conversations. You're in a spiritual conversation, and it's no longer about really getting to the gospel and sharing the gospel with this person. Now it's a battle. You've been challenged, and you you just want to win the fight. You want to win the argument. Christians are happy to lose the argument. We don't need to win the argument. We don't need to end up on the, the, the top side. We're happy sometimes to bow out because we want to be gentle and respectful. I'm not trying to be in people's face. I'm not yelling at people. I'm not fighting people. I'm pleading with people that they might trust Christ, that they might believe the gospel and be saved, that there is a way to share the gospel with gentleness and respect. Does that mean that we're never direct? No, sometimes we're direct, right? Sometimes we speak honestly, we speak directly, we're sharing things that really matter, that are important, that have eternal weight. It doesn't mean that we're, we back down, it doesn't mean that we never say hard things, or we never in hard conversations, but as best as we're able, we want to do it with gentleness and respect. That Paul tells Timothy that as best as he's able to live at peace with all men. That we're, as we can't always control what other people say or do or how they re- respond to us. But it, it is on us to do everything we can to live at peace with all men. To, to share the gospel with gentleness and, and respect. What you'll find, if you approach people with gentleness and respect, often you may get shot down, but you'll, you'll have another opportunity. Because if people find that they can actually talk to you and not be screamed at, and not be in a fight, they will find that they'll, they'll come back to you again. And, and what I find often is that they'll come back to you, not intentionally to have a gospel conversation. They won't come back to you and say, hey, would you tell me the gospel again? I'd like to get saved. But what will happen is they'll come back to you when their mother dies, or when their marriage is in trouble, or when they get laid off. And they remember that you loved them, and that you were a Christian, and they recognize gentleness and respect in you. And they, they see you as a person who will care about them. And what, what you'll find is that it will open up opportunities for you to share the gospel. That you'll be a person they come to. The harsh people in your life, when you're having a hard day, are those the people you go to? No, they're the people that you avoid. We want to be the people as believers that the unbelievers in our life know when things hit the fan, when things are falling apart, I can go to that guy. And he's going to care about me. And we have the opportunity then to not just be gracious and kind and, and compassionate in their hurt, but we can share with them the gospel. So we share the gospel with love. We, we love people. We, we, the attitude is one of gentleness and respect. The posture of an evangelist is one of mercy. I, I love the book of Jude. The end of the book, uh, Judas tells them to, to, to keep themselves in the most holy faith. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So what he says is that what we're waiting for is ultimately mercy. That what we have when Jesus comes is not the result of what we've earned. Or that when we see Jesus, everything that we receive from Jesus will be mercy. We get nothing from Jesus for what we do. What you receive in your salvation is all of mercy. And he says that this, this is true of you. So therefore, and have mercy on those who doubt. Those who are struggling. On those who are weak in the faith, have mercy on them. And then he says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Right? That mercy seeks to, to reach out and to snatch those from the fire. Right? He, he uses this, this image of the garment stained by the flesh. The, the image there, if you go on in Jude, is, is essentially of their clothes smelling of fire. That they're in danger of going to hell. And he says, you have mercy on them. That you reach out to, this is what evangelism is. We're reaching out to try to snatch people from the fire. To, to pull them back from the edge. To, that they might come to, to faith in Jesus. That this is what we're called to do. That evangelism is an act of mercy. We have been shown mercy. 
So therefore, we want to show mercy to, to other people. Uh, this, is what we're, uh, this is what we're called to do. I've shared, right? Spurgeon said, uh, Spurgeon, one of the greatest Baptist, Baptist preachers says, if people uh, would go to hell, let them leap over our bodies. Right? That, that we are pleading with people to not go to hell. That it is an act of mercy. We have been shown mercy. If you die and you go to heaven, it's because of mercy. We want to show mercy to other people. We want to snatch them from the fire. The easy, at Buck Run, the easiest way, this is why we encourage everybody to be in a community group, is, is community group. The easiest way to make those connections. Because it is harder in Sunday school the way our Sunday school model is. And it's part of the reason why, why we sort of split. The, the old Sunday school um, is, is still good. It's not a bad model. But often what we found is that uh, in age-based Sunday school classes that we're trying to both be community and teaching is that many classes did one really well and then didn't have time for the other. So some classes were really good at community, and they prayed for each other, and they knew each other really well, and every week they feel bad because, like, we didn't make it to the lesson, or we only got, like, a quarter ways through the lesson. And then there were other classes that, like, no, we're, we're starting the lesson. We're, we're, we're going to get through the lesson. And so they don't know each other as well. They don't spend time, as much time in prayer. And so part of the reason that we said, let's, let's do more core teaching time by itself. Let's take that community piece, and let's break it out where you can actually have more time and you're not trying to shove community in between uh, before and after a lesson. Uh, that's the goal of community groups is that you would really have time to know people. It's the best place to, to know, to be in those relationships so that if somebody's walking away, if somebody's saying, I'm not a believer, that you might, you might go after them. Does that answer your question now? To recruit. Uh, so that's part of the reason why we have community groups, that we might have accountability, that we might be in community with each other. Um, and so the posture of, ev- of an evangelist is, is mercy. The hands of an evangelist, service. For though I am free from all, Paul says, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. If you, if you know Paul's life, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the sermon today. If you know Paul's life, Paul was a servant. That Much of Paul's ministry, Paul was self-supported. Paul worked another job. Paul worked as a tent maker. Paul worked for himself so that he wouldn't take money from the churches. So one, so the money could go to other places. But Paul didn't even want to, to have the accusation laid on him that he was preaching the gospel for money. So instead, Paul served people. He lays down his life for people. Paul, think about how hard it is. It's hard to be a bivocational pastor now. Think about Paul's life. As much as he's traveled, how hard it was for him to, to work his own way. Though he could have received, right, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he could have received it. He would not have been doing the wrong thing for receiving support from the churches. But he laid down that right to support himself, that he might have an opportunity to win more people, that he might gain a hearing with more people. That This is why we serve people, that we might demonstrate for them the love of Jesus and, and win ourselves a hearing. This is what Sir Frankfurt is. So when we started Sir Frankfurt four-ish years ago, three or four years ago, we were trying to, to ask a couple questions. One, how might we demonstrate the love of Jesus to our community? What are places that we can come alongside and say, we love you and we want to support you and we want you to, to know that we love you? So how can we serve our community schools? How can we, how can we come along then? When we do serve Frankfurt and we do landscaping at schools or paint or we're, we're not, we don't put up a sign, we're not asking them to put a, you know, Buck Run did this sign. What we're trying to do is to show them we love you because we think Jesus loves you, right? that we want to demonstrate for you the love of Jesus that we might gain a hearing. Right, that one day when Scott shows up, or the new student pastor, whoever that may be, Lord knows, uh, shows up to the high school, and he says, I'm from Buck Run. You know what? The wheels are greased a little bit. That we have a good relationship. They know, okay, you love us. And Scott says, I want to go have some lunch with some students. Or, or they say, hey, we need somebody to, to come be an assistant coach for the soccer team. And somebody from Buck Run says, I'll do it. And we have a good relationship with them. Oh, yeah, Buckrum people, they're invested in the school. They know us. They love us. Yeah, you come on. And now we have gospel opportunities that we're trying to show the love of Jesus by serving people that we might win some of them. And we're not going to win all of them. You can't win them all. But you can serve people that you might win a hearing, that, that people would see that Buck Run is a place that loves the community, that we love you. And when people see our love, when they see our service poured out, we'll have opportunities uh, to be able to share the gospel. This is what Paul does. He lays down his rights. He doesn't have to do all these things. He lays down his right to, uh, to receive re- support so that he can serve. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk about this in the sermon today. In, in Ephesus, Paul would make tents every day. The, the work schedule in, in Asia, in Turkey there, was like 7 to 11, and then they would have like an afternoon break, and then would pick back up at 4 to 9.30. And so what Paul does every day is make tents from 7 to 11, and then from 4 to 9.30, and then from 11 to 4, 
he would go into the hall of Tyrannus, this, this sort of public debate forum, and he would preach. He would reason with people. He would plead with people. He would disciple people. He would share the gospel on this really long lunch break from 11 to 4. He did that every day for two years in Ephesus. Every day. It's, if you just add that up, that's, he did it six, six days a week, five hours a day for two years. That's like 30, over 3,100 hours that Paul spends right, every day working hard building tents so that he can have a living, and then in the time that he has, going to the public place and finding people, offering his life up, that he might reason with them, that he might plead with them, persuade them to trust Christ. This is what Christian evangelism looks like. It looks like service. That you will find, especially with people you work with, people in your neighborhood, if you find easy ways to serve them, you will be surprised by the gospel opportunities that open up. Uh, we've, we've talked about, uh, even in here, uh, intentional consumerism, right? Going to the same restaurant or going to the same store, asking for the same waitress, like trying to learn their rhythm so that you can have them. Even if you go now, if you go out to lunch today and you ask your waiter or your waitress, hey, is there a way that I could be praying for you? I almost guarantee you, one, that they'll be shocked that you ask and that they'll actually share something with you. You'll find that most people live in a world in which nobody cares about them. Nobody's asking what's going on in their life. No one's asking, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? And if you'll show some just simple service, not, not what can you do for me, not how quick can, can you get my drink, or did you get my order right, but hey, I'm here. God has put us together. Right? You're my waiter. You're my waitress. What, what can I be praying for you? I'm not just looking to see what I can get from you, but how can I serve you? How can I be praying for you? What's going on in your life? You'll find that people will open up, that they'll actually share. You'll have gospel opportunities because that's not how the world operates. The world generally doesn't care about people, and as Christians, we get to show that we do care. So the, the hands of an evangelist are service. Or we serve people so that we might uh, be able to have gospel opportunity to show them the love of Jesus. The eth- ethic of an evangelist is persuasion. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 12, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what, we are known, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to post about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Right? That Paul says that knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Right? I think we talked about this in week one. Every now and then I'll, I'll hear somebody share the gospel or, or hear somebody tell a story about how they shared the gospel and and they'll share the gospel. They'll say, here's what Jesus has done. Here's the, the bare bones of the gospel. And it's presented this way. You take it or leave it. So Jesus did this thing, right? If you believe, you'll be saved. But I'm safe. It's up to you, right? You just, I don't care what you do. This is your thing. You take it or leave it. Right? Is that what we're called to do as evangelists, as people who share the gospel? Is that what you do with your kids? Hey, when they're sick, do you say, well, here's the medicine. You take it. You take it or leave it. It's, not, it's your sickness. It ain't up to me. All right, I can't do this for you. I don't care what happens to you. You take the medicine or you don't. No, you're good parents. You wouldn't do that to your children. Right? When they're young, what do you have to do? You gotta, sometimes you've got to make them take it. Right? You've got to hide it. But, but often, what, yeah, yeah you, you're trying to say, I, I want you to see why you need to take it. I want you to understand what this is going to do. Right? That we're not just saying take it or leave it. We're persuading, right? Because we believe that this is good for them. As evangelists, we're not simply saying, well, here's the gospel. I don't care what happens to you. I'm safe. This is up to you. If you don't take it, no skin off my back. It doesn't hurt me. No, as, as evangelists, if people come to say, I'm going to share the gospel with you, it makes a difference to look somebody in the eye and say, not just is this true, but I want this for you. I want you to believe the gospel. I am not an uninterested observer, right? I'm just laying this out. I don't care if you eat it or not. I don't care if you take it or not. I don't care what you do. But to look somebody in the, in the eye and say, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to die and to go to a crisis eternity. I, I know grace and mercy and forgiveness in Jesus, and I want you to know the same grace and mercy and forgiveness. I want you to have the joy that is, that is in Christ, or that we're persuading, we're, we're, we're pressing in to say, we want this for you. We care about you. We, we actually want to see you trust Jesus, not we're uninterested. Right? That, that what we are doing is pers- we're persuading. We're answering questions. We're demonstrating why the gospel matters. We're pressing in on the places that they might hide from the gospel. If you remember, we talked about that, all the ways in which people are trying to hide from the gospel, to to keep it from uh, speaking to their heart, that we're we're pressing in 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 those ways because we want to persuade people. We're not simply laying it out and say, take it or leave it. We don't care. 
we're, we're pressing in because we want, we want people to actually believe the gospel. Uh, th- this ethic of, of an evangelist is, is persuasion. You think about the difference it would make if the people in your workplace, the people in your family, or people on your street, not just knew that you were a Christian, but actually believed that you wanted them to be a Christian. You remember the story Dr. York shared uh, a few weeks ago, the first, when he did the first two parables of Luke 15, of the mother who said, I want you to come share the gospel with my son. And he's like, yeah, you, you have him set up an appointment with me. Or that it was not, there was not a, an urgency there to share the gospel with him. It was, yeah, if he wants to come, I'll, I'll talk to him. If he'll, if he'll come talk to me. You think about what, would, what the difference that it would make in your life if the people in your workplace not only knew that you were a believer, but knew you wanted them to be a Christian. That you cared about them. That when you shared the gospel, you weren't simply trying to shove your stuff on them, but you actually wanted them to know the mercy and the grace and the joy that is found in Christ. It matters that when we try to persuade people, we approach it differently. Now, we can't manipulate people, right? Even if we could manipulate people into Jesus, there's, that's not real faith. We're not trying to scare people into Jesus. We're not trying to manipulate people into Jesus. We're not trying to argue people into Jesus, right? When we, so when I say persuasion, hear me, I'm not saying you twist their arm, you, you conjole them, you, you do things to manipulate them into Christ, right? That, I would argue, causes more damage than it does good. Right? All of us know people that are reluctant to actually hear the gospel because they were manipulated at a service when they were 12, and they walked an aisle, and though it's really clear they don't know Jesus, right? Well, I walked an aisle. I signed a card. I got baptized. Right? That, there was a guy back 40 years ago that said, I'm good, so I don't need to worry about it, right? Because somebody manipulated them into making a decision, into walking an aisle and into signing a card. We're not trying to manipulate people. We're not trying to control them, to twist their arm. We're persuading them. We're showing them what the gospel is. We're showing them the alternative. We're, we're speaking from a Christian worldview, answering questions, pressing in as often as we can. So one of the questions that we, we often ask is, well, what do you do? You share the gospel with a coworker, you share the gospel with a neighbor, and they shut you down. And they say, you know, I'm not interested. I don't want to, I appreciate it, it's your thing. Glad for you, I'm happy that you have that. But, but that's, that's not for me. So what do you do with that person? You pray for them. You, you keep yourself as a model in front of them. You build a relationship with them, right? And you keep looking for opportunities, right? Sometimes those won't come again. Sometimes somebody will shut you down, and they will continue to shut you down. They will not open back up, and you will not have another opportunity. But that's not true of everybody. There are a lot of people now who are believers who one day said, I'll never be a Christian. That's your thing. That's not my thing. You think about Herschel and Tanya's, Tanya's father, Herschel's father-in-law. For years and years and years said, I'm happy for you guys. I'm glad that's your thing. Jesus is great for you, but I'm not going to trust Jesus. And they kept pressing. They kept loving him. They kept praying for him. They kept looking for opportunities. They, they kept trying to persuade him. They kept showing him the gospel, demonstrating it in their life and how they lived and how they raised their children and how they worked that he might have an opportunity that at the end of his life. Right, he trusted Jesus. Right, so what, we, what I, I want you to understand is that we don't write people off. Right? It's, this is not a one shot. Hey, I shared the gospel with my neighbor and he said no. So my conscience is clear. I don't ever need to worry about him again. He had his shot. Right? Where would you be if somebody had only shared the gospel with you once, would you be a Christian? From a, speaking humanly, from a human standpoint, would you be a Christian if you got one shot, somebody shared the gospel with you one time? I wouldn't. The God used people sharing the gospel with me, different people in different ways and in different venues, had different times over time before I came to faith in Jesus. Most people hear the gospel quite a bit before they actually trust Christ. Right, so we're not saying, well, you had your shot. I shared the gospel with you. You rejected me. I'm washing my hands of you, and I'm walking away. I'm praying, right? I'm praying and asking the Lord to soften your heart. I'm praying, and this might seem mean. I'm praying for the lost people in my life. I'm praying the Lord would do stuff in their life that would cause them to realize their need of him. That though that might be painful, that that is less painful than a Christless eternity. I'm praying that God would do things, that God would put them in a spot, and that they realize their need of him, that God would show them that they cannot handle life on their own. Right? I'm praying for opportunities. God, give me opportunities. Help me to see the opportunities that you give me. Don't let me pass them by. Don't let me be foolish. Let me have eyes to see it. Give me the words to say. 
Right? When, when I have those opportunities, help me to, to be winsome and to be kind and loving and, and to actually tell them the gospel and, and to, to seek to, to win them to, to Jesus. Right? That we, we are pressing in on people. Right? That, that we don't know right, when doors are going to close. No one knows what happens tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. If there's one thing that has been really, really interesting to me in this whole, uh, I'm a big NBA fan, so Kobe Bryant, who passed away a couple weeks ago, one of the things that's been interesting to me, just from a sociological standpoint, just watching the reaction, seems to be that this event has reminded lots of people that life is not promised to them. That no amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of se- seeming stability can save you from death. That we all die. That, that rich people die in plane crashes. That, you, that it's, you're, you're not invincible. That I, I, seem this, I see this awakening in tons of people who are not believers, who have no spiritual world, worldview, who are realizing and reminded again in this really gritty way, life is hard and it, death is going to come to all of us. And to ask the question, what, what happens then? Right? What happens after death, that it's going to come to me too. That I, I, I want people that, to, around me to have that, that sense of eternity. I'm pressing in. I'm using opportunities that I have in order to, to share the gospel with people. I, I am pressing on. I don't know when doors are going to close. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not promised tomorrow. The people in my life aren't promised tomorrow. That, that doors are going to close sometimes for seasons. Sometimes maybe long seasons. Maybe forever. Right? You don't know when the, the, the lost people around you, you don't know when your door is going to close. When death is going to come to them, when they're going to move away, they're going to take a different job, they're going to go somewhere else, they're going to shut you down and no longer have the relational impact with you that you can share the gospel. You don't know when the door is going to close. So don't give up on them, but keep pressing in. Keep looking for opportunities. Keep praying for them. Keep seeking to be wise with the opportunities that God gives you that you might see them uh, come to know Christ.